morning. Um, oh, my name is Sylvia. I'm from the University of Melbourne, so I'm in Melbourne at the moment. Uh, firstly, I want to apologize for not being able to be there in person. Um, and secondly, I'm going to have to apologize for a very uh, bad cold that is making my voice um, slightly hoarse. Um, I assure you that uh, it will not affect the presentation. I'm going to announce it as best as, as I can. So, yeah, I go. As you can see, the topic uh, of my presentation is on higher wage migrant men's imaginaries of Chinese masculinities in Singapore. And it says, I have permanent residency. Now, let me start with my paper. <coughs> Although there is a growing body of work focusing on male migration, literature on migrant men reflects a bias where work and economics are seen as central to their lives. Moreover, there have been few studies on migration and heterosexuality, especially in the Asian region. Yet migrant men are not just workers, but also father, fathers, husbands, lovers, boyfriends. It is in lieu of migrant men's various positionalities, and specifically heterosexuality, that has seen a small body of work emerge. Indeed, as scholars Wash, Shen, and Willis observed, I quote, a migration focus illuminates how spatial dislocation provides opportunities for and constraints on both men and women to play out different heterosexual identities, <clears throat> unquote. <clears throat> Studying migrant men and how they perform heterosexuality and sexual desires then can illuminate how masculinities transform with migration. The literature on Chinese masculinity in the field of migration, while growing, is limited. Specifically, in studies of high-wage male migrants, Hebins has remained exceptional in his study of Chinese masculinities in Australia. He found that traditional Chinese values, such as being the head of a family, household, remained resilient in defining his respondents' masculinities while confronting Australian hegemonic masculinity. Uh, Australian masculinity is being more defined extensively by alcohol and sports. <coughs> Importantly, Kibins found the markers of masculinity among his high-wage respondents as followed. I quote, Centrality of work and education, being a successful provider and protector, the accumulation of wealth and power, unquote. Markers which resonated with other scholars' findings on Chinese masculinity. Indeed, work, materiality, and wealth translate to the ability to fulfill roles as breadwinners and providers for the family. <clears throat> These roles are viewed as integral to one's sense of masculinity and recur throughout literature on both masculinity and Chinese masculinity. Moreover, there have been scholars who have similarly placed their studies on Chinese men's performance of masculinity in contexts of capitalist globalization, where, I quote, the dominant ideology of the post-reform masculinity has been centered on men's capacities to make money and generate economic power, unquote. <clears throat> the literature on Chinese masculinity and migration has highlighted three things. Firstly, that because Chinese men's masculinity is so highly tied to work, Chinese masculinity cannot be discussed without reference to the global economy. Secondly, the link of Chinese masculinity with the global economy has produced hegemonic masculine ideals where economic power is proof of virility. And finally, thirdly, 
while the symbols of Chinese masculinity may change according to social context, these symbols still translate to the ability of men to be breadwinners and providers. In other words, the essence of Chinese masculinity is pervasively defined by men taking on roles of breadwinners and providers. It is in lieu of these observations from the external literature that this paper enters. <coughs> Migrant labour in Singapore is highly stratified. Essentially, low-wage migrant workers, colloquially termed foreign workers, are differentiated from professional expatriates termed foreign talent. So the table you see here is actually the different classes of uh, work paths, work permits for professionals. I use higher wage to refer to migrant workers who are wage higher than low-wage workers uh, whose permits are, are outside of this, uh, of this, so basically they earn something like less than $2,000 a month for low wage workers. But uh, whose, so with the higher wage workers, uh, their actual incomes may actually vary greatly, even though I say high wage. Higher wage workers are considered skilled professionals who come mainly from the US, Britain, France, Australia, Japan. South Korea, China, and India. <clears throat> Since Singapore's main economic strategy is tilted to attracting a highly skilled workforce, immigration policies has been liberalized to make it easier for higher wage immigrants to gain permanent residency. Uh, from now on, I'll say PR and Singaporean citizenship. As such, Higher wage workers who are employment pass holders usually hold, I quote, a good university degree, professional qualifications or specialist skills, unquote. Uh, this is from the Ministry of Manpower Singapore. Or are entrepreneurs and businessmen. The holders of these passes do not have to pay levies and may bring with them family members if they earn more than $5,000 a month. In other words, the state defines their ability to hold higher wages in Singapore as their right to the red carpet treatment. The contrast in the treatment of foreign talent versus that of foreign workers is stuck. While foreign talent is rewarded with privileges, including the possibility of permanent residence, Foreign workers are highly restricted, such as in movement and with mandatory health checks. The state appears to directly link social problems <coughs> only to the low-wage workers, while higher-wage workers are seen as unproblematic. The tendency to think of foreign talents as unproblematic is however a dangerous one. Foreign talent are often assumed as a homogeneous group and seen as possessing a quote, cosmopolitan cultural capital unquote, that will enable them to integrate in any part of the world. This assumption is challenged by the presence of Chinese talent who do not always fit the stereotype associated with Westerners. For instance, Skilled Chinese migrants may not be highly paid expatriates or transnational elites and may be more financially modest. In fact, even as Leong suggested that more recent migrants, uh, who we describe as young dragons, are well-educated, enterprising and conversant in good English, Chinese migrants have been demonstrated to work in fields that may not be the norm for Western expatriates. They may also choose their migrant destination for a variety of less than economic reasons. Certainly, the fact that many Chinese higher wage workers may indeed not be highly paid suggests that imaginaries of Chinese masculinity contingent on economic success in the form of a house or car so in Chinese we say yu fang, yu che, may not be more stable than that of the low-wage workers. 
or traditional markers of economic success, such as a car in Beijing can cost quite a lot, it is an unreachable luxury for many migrants or locals in Singapore. For instance, <coughs> a Volkswagen Jetta Sportline with licensing in Beijing may cost around USD $35,000. The same car alone in Singapore costs around USD $84,000, not including licensing. So something like more than three, more than three times the price. Furthermore, housing in Singapore is prohibitively expensive, where public housing occupied by 82% of Singaporeans <coughs> is only available for purchase by permanent residents and Singaporean citizens. A one-bedroom apartment costs around USD $50,000 in painting, while similar private one-bedroom apartment costs around USD $250,000 in Singapore, <coughs> around five times the price. <coughs> Subsidies and new public housing is also only available to Singaporean citizens. In other words, <coughs> the house and car that defines an ideal man in China are even more expensive and unattainable in Singapore. Moreover, the prohibitive prices of private housing in Singapore meant that the alternative of obtaining public housing in Singapore is highly dependent on one's status of residence, so whether you have PR or Singaporean citizenship. This, I argue, has meant that male migrants' social imaginaries of Chinese masculinity are increasingly tied to possessing permanent residence or Singaporean citizenship. Hmm. While higher wage Chinese male migrants may not suffer the same filled masculinity as their low-wage counterparts in terms of economic status, <coughs> their masculinity is challenged by local women based on their nationality and by Chinese migrant women based on their Singaporean citizenship status. A quick look on personal ads posted by women in a forum dedicated to Chinese migrants in Singapore show that the Singaporean citizenship or PR status was often explicitly stated as a requirement for potential partners. It was difficult to gain insights from my higher weight Chinese male respondents with regards to dating Chinese Singaporean women. None of them did. And those who had partners had Chinese ones. They also showed reluctance in discussing dating local women. They often claimed they had not suffered any discrimination even without me suggesting so, <clears throat> clearly exhibiting that they were aware of these causes of local women shunning Chinese migrant men. Due to higher wage Chinese male migrants reluctance to discuss the topic, I have had to look to additional sources. Signs of discrimination against them were found from online research and chats with my respondents. For instance, the quote below came from an online discussion among Singaporean women about whether one can accept Chinese male migrants as partners in the manner many local men have accepted Chinese female partners. Mm. So this quote reads, I don't think I can tolerate PRC men. It makes me feel so cheap. Men are different. PRC women are cheap and easy. We women have yet to reach that extent. Hi Mary, you are so right. That accent is going to be a complete turn off. I really can't imagine myself talking dirty to PRC men in Mandarin. Laugh out loud. <clears throat> Chat with my Chinese Singaporean respondents <clears throat> also confirmed certain prejudices. I asked if they would date Chinese men. One responded that she would only if he was rich, capable, and from Shanghai. I asked why Shanghai, to which she responded that they were, I quote, more refined, unquote. <clears throat> On the same topic, another quit. I quote, no, never, unquote. I asked why. She said, I quote, I hate all PRCs, 
male or female, unquote. So PRC is used colloquially in Singapore, uh, often in a derogatory manner, to refer to Chinese migrants. The Chinese male migrant, despite his apparent social economic capital then, is likely to find himself with limited marriage options in Singapore. <coughs> now, some, here are some images uh, of Chinese migrant men in Singapore that are circulated online. Uh, you can see uh, the picture with the cat. It's um, a circulated <coughs> piece that says, uh, beware of uh, Chinese men uh, with pet carriers because they are apparently looking for uh, stray cats uh, to kill and eat. <coughs> and then uh, some of the headlines are quite self-explanatory. Uh, affair of the PRC Jiglo or uh, apparently a PRC defecating in public. And then the last picture there of uh, apparently a uh, Chinese man uh, vomiting and dirtying the public transport in Singapore. <clears throat> so these are not truths, right? They're just circulated images. <clears throat> and indeed, racial and cultural proximities can be a bane rather than a boon. This is conquered by uh, Yo and Huang's study on sexual proximities of migrant women in Singapore. They suggested that where sexual politics are concerned, being proximate to the dominant self in terms of race can come to be a burden than what is traditionally considered a benefit. I have also written uh, elsewhere on this, uh, specifically on how Chinese migrant women uh, act as boundary markers uh, for local women. So I will not be elaborating about that here. <clears throat> it was actually a very recent paper uh, published in Gender, Place and Culture. So if you are interested, it's called uh, uh, Chinese Migrant Women as Boundary Markers in Singapore. So coming back to this paper then, uh, we can conclude that Chinese men are discriminated uh, according to their nationality. And this has led many to search for potential Chinese partners by placing personal ads in forums popular with Chinese migrants in Singapore. <coughs> I'm going to show you an example of one ad here. <coughs> You can see that the headline says, uh, Born in 86, reliable, high-quality man looking for Miss Right. Now, the first line says, I am a PR. Right? It's quite long, so you don't have to read everything. Just take your, turn your attention to uh, the ones in bold. So, the first thing, I am a PR. And then in the middle, it says, I have the generosity and frankness of the northerners and the meticulousness and diligence of the southerners. Right? Um, this ad you'll see, this ad you see is typical of many others. Especially in stating that one had PR and or citizen, Singaporean citizenship in the first few lines of self-introduction. It was also more common for the posters that declared their PR and or Singaporean citizenship to have a long list of requirements for the kind of female they are seeking as can be seen. So this post this was actually very long, very, very long. So I had to cut it short to present it here. But you can see from the second paragraph, it says requirements, kind, hearted, warm, loving. And in the middle, it has even it even asked for good figure and more voluptuous. Um, so the requirements actually continue from even here. So very, very long requirement. <clears throat> that once Chinese masculinity is contingent on having residency, it's also shown by the following ad. So the second ad I'm going to show you, where his lack of residency as yet is a point he felt necessary to explain. Indeed, it shows an anxiety on the part of the poster that he may potentially uh, be rejected by women who privileges men with residency. So here, there's a second ad. <clears throat> it was a Quite long, not that long as not as long as the first one, but it's quite long. But I cut it short here. And can I turn your attention to um, the words in bold? It says, "I do not currently have PR, but I believe I will have everything I need after marriage. Hence, there is no need to worry, including PR." And then further on in bold again, it says, "What will happen five or ten years later? Who knows, right?" <clears throat> 
Now, as Phoenix in 2004 discussed, neoliberalism is about the continue, continued need to change oneself, make informed choices, engage in competition, and taking up the chances available in the market and the government. And as the personal ads above show, higher-wage Chinese male migrants use a neoliberal approach to position their masculinities in order to access Chinese partners in the context of Singapore. By declaring one's possession of PR and or citizenship in their personal ads, Chinese male migrants show awareness of the need to change oneself in a market that favours Singaporean citizenship, <coughs> make choices to take on PR citizenship that will increase their attractiveness in the marriage market, engage in competition with other users who may not have PR citizenship, and taking up the chances of PR citizenship available in the market and the government. So my emphasis as, uh, in those ads in bold <laughs> reflects the privileged flexibility of both posters. Uh, one ad suggested that he was flexible, right, in encompassing personality traits <clears throat> of both the northerner and southerner Chinese and is willing to take on hardship and challenges. The other suggested he is up for anything in five or ten years. <clears throat> Indeed, Ong Ai Hua has noted that flexible subjects are able to, I quote, to turn displacement into advantageous positioning in a range of local contexts. Unquote. <clears throat> the pervasiveness of male gender roles as providers and breadwinners are implicit in the poster's ads. This is especially since citizenship and or PR status, as mentioned earlier, are tied to the ability to purchase public housing in Singapore. As mentioned earlier, Hegemonic ideals of Chinese masculinity in China are defined by the possession of a house or car, your fang, your che. Symbols that show one has the wealth and ability to be the breadwinner and provider for the household. While the definition of a successful man may have switched to one that has citizenship and or PR in the Singaporean context, the essential male gender role as provider and breadwinner has not changed, whether it is a house, a car, or PR, or citizenship. All of these materials symbolize the ability for a man to be a breadwinner or provider for the family. Hence, while Chinese male migrants have had to be flexible in positioning themselves vis-à-vis -vis ideals of citizenship, PR in Singapore, they still suffer the same male gender role expectations, whether in China or Singapore, of being breadwinners and providers. <clears throat> now I am coming close to my conclusion. Kasang H argued that the proof of national belonging to the state can, in a practical sense, operate as proof of national non-belonging to the dominant culture. <clears throat> In other words, since possession of citizenship or PR status does not require declaration by those who have acquired citizenship by birth, <coughs> excuse me, higher wage Chinese migrants need to need to emphasize their citizenship PR status stigmatizes them on a practical level. Essentially, Personal ads stating one's citizenship PR status reproduces one's national non-belonging. As such, personal ads contribute to the differentiated modalities of national belonging. <coughs> the flexible subject making of higher wage Chinese migrants thus faces a catch-22, where the statement of citizenship and or PR status can bring one closer to hegemonic ideals of Chinese masculinity, but at the same time reproduces one's national non-belonging. In conclusion, this paper has examined higher wage Chinese male migrants' imaginaries of Chinese masculinities 
I have shown that higher wage Chinese male migrants adopt flexible subject making through stating their citizenship PR and or PR in person at. However, the flexible subject making of higher wage Chinese migrants presents a paradox where on the one hand, the statement of citizenship PR reproduces uh, brings, may bring one closer to hegemonic ideals of Chinese masculinity. And on the other hand, declaring one's citizenship PR status reproduces one's national non blocking Finally, I conclude that examining the male migrant worker through the lens of race, class, and gender in context advances a more nuanced understanding of migration and its displacements. In particular, this paper has contributed not just to an understanding of the gendered subjectivities of the migrant worker, but also how the intersection of race and class can work to displace him. Thank you very much for uh, listening to me, uh, despite the very hoarse voice and uh, it being a recording. Uh, I welcome all your feedback, uh, any, any forms of feedback uh, during the Q&A session, which will be on Skype. We'll see you in just a bit.